Bill Nagley and the George Mason Law Review Symposium Editor. Our next panel, Perspectives on Privileges and Immunities, explores the origins, purposes, and meaning of the Privileges and Immunities Clause and the contemporary legal disputes over its application. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this panel, Judge Don Willett of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. <laughs> I like the sound of that. Thank you for that polite smattering of applause. <laughs> Native Texan, Judge Willett's devoted to his professional life in public service. Before joining the federal judiciary, Judge Willett served for 12 years on the Supreme Court of Texas. Prior to taking his talents to the bench, he served as the legal counsel of the Texas Attorney General, Texas Governor, a United States Attorney General, and the President of the United States. After law school, he clerked for Judge Williams in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, and then practiced law at Haynes and Boone. Judge Willett's achievements are not limited to the legal and academic spheres. He's also a former uh, rodeo bull rider and professional drummer. And in 2015, he was named the Peter Laureate of Texas. Along with his wife, Tiffany, he's the proud co-founder of the Three Lee Willets. Uh, I'll now hand the panel over to Judge Willett. <laughs> so, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to moderate this star-studded panel on the unsung, unheeded, unheralded privileges or immunities clause. So a few weeks ago, I wrote a dissent quoting <laughs> quoting one of our panelists, Professor Bob Cottrell who described the Second Amendment as the Rodney Dangerfield of the Bill of Rights. And if the Second Amendment is the Rodney Dangerfield, then the Privileges or Immunities Clause is the Lord Voldemort of the Constitution. It is the clause that must not be named. So in terms of order today, uh, we'll, we'll basically proceed chronologically from pre-14th Amendment to framing the amendment, to modern debates about the amendment, and if we have time, we'll invite some speeches from the audience. We'll invite some questions from the audience. <laughs> Short, <coughs> tweet link questions. Queries that actually end with a question mark would be great. Um, so I'm not going to repeat all the panel members' bios that are printed for you in the program, um, but I may add a choice bit of trivia about each of our all-star speakers who will each have about 10 minutes um, to regale you before we invite questions if we have time. So I will introduce them as it's their turn to speak. And batting lead off will be Professor Robert Cottrell of George Washington University Law School. Um, Bob will help us kind of set the stage by describing what the situation on the ground looked like in the post-bellum South after the Civil War. So he's done exten extensive work on the Black Code including disarmament laws um, on public and private violence against freedmen. And then he'll discuss how the clause does or does not uh, respond to those concerns. He is a retired lieutenant colonel in the Air Force Reserves. And not only is he a renowned Second Amendment scholar, he's also an excellent marksman and firearms teacher. And at his law school, he is known for auctioning off trips to the shooting range with a student to raise funds to subsidize public interest fellowships. So a couple of years ago, there was a funny story told about Professor Cottrell and the Volok conspiracy. And it went like this, quote, a few months ago, Bob Cottrell and I were going to dinner, debating going to DC. And we ran into a friend and Bob was concerned he might be packing. And he asked him in his customary way, are you at this moment exercising the full panoply of your constitutional right? <laughs> and this person considered the question for a moment and answered no. And Bob then suggested it was okay to dine in DC. <laughs> so Professor Cosswell, thanks for being here. Take it away. Thank you, Judge. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, Gene Volok and I and, and, and our friend uh, went to D.C. and dined. And uh, what we did was to get uh, uh, to exercise another aspect of my, uh, my academic uh, life. Uh, we went to a Brazilian restaurant. 
where I had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to butcher the Portuguese language while ordering uh, various, uh, uh, various dishes. Um, well, uh, let me get to uh, the question of, uh, the, of privileges or immunities and uh, what's going on uh, at, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Reconstruction, uh, and, and perhaps a few words that might take us a bit beyond that. Um, one of the things uh, that's uh, occurring, obviously, is immediately after the Civil War, 1865, we've got the Black Codes. And uh, I find the, the Black Codes and, of course, Congress's uh, reaction to it uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, the, the whole phenomenon is very interesting. One of the things that I, I study very much is, uh, is the issue of race, uh, not only in the United States, but throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in 2013, I did a book, The Long Lingering Shadows, Slavery, Race, and Law in the American Hemisphere, where I looked at slavery, emancipation, and civil rights in comparative perspective. One of the things that's unique about the United States is that in most nations, emancipation is a fairly simple event. Uh, slavery is ended, uh, and that, at least from the law's point of view, uh, tends to be the end of the story. Uh, and that's in part, a broad oversimplification, of course, but uh, uh, what happens in most American nations is the free Afro-American is a citizen uh, before general emancipation. Uh, that is, there are slaves, but there are people of color who are free, uh, many of whom, uh, uh, you know, some of whom are at the margins of society, some of whom uh, are very much uh, at the center of society, and some have even positions of wealth and power. So there's really not the effort to define what is the status of the free Afro-American uh, in, let us say, Brazil or Colombia or Peru uh, or other American nations, the way, at least not to the same degree that it exists in the United States, where there's a real question, okay, there had been free black people certainly before the Civil War, but you also had the Dred Scott decision, which says essentially that no person of African descent can be a citizen, slave, or free. So there ha the struggle that the Civil War represents has to continue post-war because it's a struggle not only about uh, the end of slavery, but exactly what kind of freedom uh, is going to occur after the war. Is it going to be the limited, uh, very cramped freedom that free black people in the antebellum South had? Uh, is it going to be a somewhat more generous freedom that free black people in the Antebellum North had? Or is it going to be full-fledged citizenship? So that um, the, uh, the post-Civil War struggle is a question of what kind of freedom? Uh, a question that, by and large, you don't have uh, in the rest of the hemisphere. The South, uh, immediately after the war, moves to uh, essentially uh, say the kind of freedom you're, uh, that the, the newly emancipated black population is going to have is going to be uh, a very restricted freedom. The kind of restrictions that the free black population in the North has uh, before the Civil War and perhaps even a more restricted uh, freedom if we can manage it. So you're not going to have uh, the right to testify at trial. Uh, you're not going to have the right uh, to reject labor contracts. Uh, you're uh, you're not certainly not going to have political rights, right to vote, uh, right to serve on juries, and, and, and so forth and so on. Uh, and you're not going to have the right to bear arms. Uh, and uh, that's very important because uh, with the emergence of the Klan and Klan-like organizations, the right uh, of the newly emancipated people to defend themselves
uh, is of paramount importance. And that right is being taken away by the black codes along with other rights. Uh, that's one of the, the, uh, uh, the things, it seems to me, that, that compels or, or pushes the Republicans in the 39th Congress to want to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. Also, the history of denying the right of abolitionists or anti-slavery speakers to speak uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the southern states before the war uh, also uh, spurs the notion that we want, you know, that the, the, the old view seen in Barron versus Baltimore that the Bill of Rights uh, only applies to the federal government, only limits the federal government, uh, has to be attacked. Uh, and uh, the vehicle uh, that they propose for doing that is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. If you look at Jacob Howard uh, of New York or Jonathan Bingham in, in the Senate, I think they're, uh, in, in, uh, uh, Jonathan Bingham of Ohio, I should uh, say, he's in the House. But if you look at them, uh, they are quite explicit that they intend to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. Uh, and that they believe that uh, Barron uh, versus Baltimore was, was simply uh, wrongly decided uh, uh, to, uh, to begin with. Uh, what happens, uh, I think, is the big question. Why don't we get that? I would suggest that in some ways, and not to offend any uh, uh, the judges uh, here, that the 14th Amendment becomes something of the vic victim of a judicial coup. Uh, that is, Congress intends not only to do things like apply the Bill of Rights to the states and also to extend robust uh, protection uh, uh, for equal rights to the newly emancipated black population. They intend for Congress to take the primary role in enforcing civil rights. The interesting thing, if you look at the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, they all have provisions calling for congressional mm -hmm. uh, enforcement. Um, and, uh, you know, and they immediately act upon it uh, with the passage of the, the 13th Amendment by passing the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which <coughs> its sponsors realize is, is, is problematic under the 13th Amendment, and one of the reasons uh, for, for pushing the 14th Amendment. But uh, they clearly have this idea, and I think the, the evidence uh, is overwhelming if we look at the fact that there's a whole series of civil rights legislations uh, that are passed between 1866 and 1875, where Congress, uh, you know, if you look at it, the people who uh, support the 14th Amendment uh, basically think, one, Congress got it wrong in Barron versus Baltimore uh, in the 1830s, and got it tragically wrong in Dred Scott. And, and the, you know, so what you have, I think, are Republicans saying, we've got to take over this business of enforcing the Constitution and constitutional rights. And that they're doing, uh, and so they, with each of the amendments, they have a congressional enforcement uh, uh, provision in that, uh, and they go on and proceed to, to pass civil rights legislation. And what you have is the court in the 1870s and 1880s, basically thwarting it. Uh, you know, I look at, at Crookshank, Crookshank, for example, uh, where a mob uh, attacks a group of black men who are, 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 are going to vote in Louisiana, and black men are going uh, armed to the polls, which was an old uh, 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 free Negro custom uh, in, in, in the United States, even in the antebellum years in those states where black men could vote. They often went to the polls armed. Uh, and the, the, a, a huge mob attacks a group of black men. They uh, kill me most of them, uh, disarm, uh, obviously they, they, they take the, their arms, uh, and they're brought up on charges, uh, among other things, of violating the First and Second Amendment rights uh, of the black men uh, through uh, the Enforcement Act of, of 1870. The court basically says, no, Congress can't do that. The 14th Amendment doesn't give Congress the power uh, to enforce uh, the provisions of the Bill of Rights uh, uh, in, in, uh, against uh, actors in the states. Uh, so we thwart off uh, 
you know, one very uh, uh, promising possibility uh, for civil rights uh, uh, legislation and enforcement through Congress and the federal government. And then, basically, uh, we have a very robust public accommodations provision in the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which is killed off by the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1883. To a remarkable extent, we spent uh, the 20th century rebuilding the civil rights architecture that we had achieved uh, in the 1860s and 1870s uh, through uh, congressional enforcement of the 14th and other uh, uh, civil, war, uh, civil War amendments. So to a very great extent, uh, the Privileges or Immunities uh, Clause, along with the rest of the 14th Amendment, I would argue, uh, were the victims of a judicial coup of a court that initially recognizes how far-reaching uh, the 14th and other amendments are with respect to race. I would cite Strouder uh, and Yik Wo as examples of that, that they're willing to recognize that these are far-reaching re with respect to race, uh, but they don't realize that these are also a revolution in federalism and uh, giving uh, Congress uh, and the federal government far-reaching powers to look at uh, 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 not only state action, but indeed private actors as well. And as I said, we've had to basically in the 20th century reconstruct uh, that architecture. Privileges or immunities, because I know time is getting short. Uh, privileges or immunities uh, get killed uh, in this, uh, uh, this judicial coup. Um, and what we have is the 20th century essentially painstakingly and awkwardly rebuilding privileges or immunities uh, through substantive due process. Uh, you know, it's sort of, well, yeah, the court got it right more or less finally with McDonald, uh, though they took the scenic route to get there. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, so I guess a, a question that I probably should end with is, you know, I took part, I, I won't uh, claim too much, but I, I was one of the people who was uh, sort of uh, uh, working on the McDonald's uh, uh, litigation uh, and advising uh, various parties and whatnot. And people spent a large amount of time saying, well, uh, you know, we've got to do this through privileges or immunities as opposed to due process. And the historian in me said, yes, yes, privileges or immunities, uh, that's, that's the way to go. That's what they really meant. Uh, let's, let's do it. The lawyer in me sort of wonders, uh, what difference does it make uh, at, at the end of the day? Uh, as I said, the, uh, with McDonald, there's still some things that, that the court should do in terms of incorporation. Um, but uh, with McDonald, uh, and we put uh, uh, Justice Thomas's uh, uh, concurrence, uh, as an asterisk to that. Bob, can you let, leave something for us to talk oh, about? Oh, okay. That's, that's <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, okay. What difference does it make? Uh, privileges or immunity or substantive due process? Thank you. Professor, thank you. So last week, my 11-year-old took a test on the Constitution and the founding, and I was talking to him, just giving some color commentary. I was talking to him about McDonald, and I got about 10 seconds in and said, McDonald. Yummy. Daddy, do we have any French fries? <laughs> a little off topic. Um, Professor Rebecca Zietlow at the University of Toledo College of Law. She's an expert on the Reconstruction era. She's going to visit with us about the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and how it relates to Section 5, which is the Congressional Enforcement Provision of the Amendment. She might talk about why the framers thought it was important to include Congressional Enforcement power in the 14th Amendment, how the scope of Section 1, including especially the Privileges and Immunities Clause, might affect the scope of Congress's enforcement power. Um, some trivia about Professor Zitlo. She confessed to me, I love to do yoga and enjoy standing on my head. <laughs> Same. Maybe who, who among us? <laughs> also, she has a, a great new book, off the Cambridge University Press, The Forgotten Emancipator, 
James Mitchell Ashley in The Ideological Origins of Reconstruction. It's a, from what I've heard, an excellent book about the principal framer of the 13th Amendment, James Ashley, an abolitionist member of Congress who, like Congressman Bingham, is from Ohio, and like Bingham, his strong support of Reconstruction ultimately ended his career, and he's all but forgotten. Ashley, by the way, is pictured in the Spielberg film, the 2012 film Lincoln. Ashley's in there. Um, and there's a portrait of Ashley painted by his great-grandson, who was also a member of Congress, uh, that hangs in the University of Toledo Law School, where Professor Dietlow teaches. So, Professor, take it away. Thank you so much, Judge. Thanks to the organizers for inviting us here to this very important celebration. And thanks for the plug for my book. I really appreciate that. Available on Amazon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I, I actually going to start by stepping back, but I am also have my timer on. So uh, uh, very briefly talking about citizen, the role of citizenship in the antebellum era. This was discussed um, in, in the first um, panel. But as we're thinking about what privileges or immunities of citizenship meant to the Reconstruction Congress, it's useful to look at what did they think the rights of citizenship meant um, in the years leading up to the Civil War. Uh, citizenship was a central theme in, in the anti-bellum debates over slavery and especially the rights of free blacks. Um, and uh, as uh, Tim uh, Sandifer mentioned in the first panel, uh, there a, a, a group of active um, uh, uh, political anti people who were active in the political anti-slavery movement, um, one of their arguments against slavery was that it violated the citizenship rights of, um, of some argued that, uh, that slaves were actually already citizens. Others argued that at the very least, uh, states could recognize free blacks as citizens whose rights could not be denied by other states. Um, the, at the very least, that right would be the right to travel safely in another state. So when there were debates in um, um, the late 1840s about black sailors who were Massachusetts residents landing in South Carolina ports who were kidnapped and sold off into slavery and representatives from Massachusetts said that violates their privileges uh, and immunities of citizenship under the Article 4 Bullet Privileges and Immunities uh, Clause. In the influential case of Corfield versus Coriel, a 1923 case, Justice Bushrod Washington, who was at the time writing Circuit, defined rights of citizenship as the fundamental rights of man, this natural rights theory of citizenship. So other, um, other activists argued that um, um, people just, that free blacks had those rights because they were citizens, at least of states. Um, John Bingham argued um, that at the that uh, rights of citizenship included access to courts, right to petition governments, and some anti-slavery activists seized on uh, Corfield versus Corfield, arguing free, black, free blacks would enjoy all of these rights. So there's all these different theories, um, not necessarily exclusive of each other, floating around about what citizenship rights meant uh, prior to the Civil War. As was mentioned in the previous panel, in Dred Scott, the Supreme Court rejected those arguments, although embracing a broad view of citizenship rights, but said that people of African descent couldn't enjoy those rights, in part because they were so broad. Um, during the Reconstruction debates, members of Congress continued to articulate those rights. Um, and in, with the 1866 Civil Rights Act, they used their congressional power to enforce the 13th Amendment to overturn the aspect of Dred Scott, which said that uh, free blacks could not be citizens. The 13th Amendment, as, as was mentioned uh, by Bob, so uh, uh, thank you, Bob, you can shorten my talk. <laughs> uh, it was the first constitutional provision empowering Congress to legislate <clears throat> to protect individual rights was these, uh, section two of the 13th Amendment, which gave Congress the power to enact appropriate legislation. And members of Congress really did see themselves and not courts as the leading protectors of rights. After all, when they thought of courts, they thought of Dred Scott. They thought of Craig versus Pennsylvania, another uh, Supreme Court case broadly reading the rights of slaveholders and restricting the rights of states to protect rights of fugitive slaves. Um, so they saw the court as a barrier to right protections. And when they used the word appropriate in the congressional enforcement clauses, 
they refer to the court's broad reading of congressional power in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland. And they use that power immediately to protect the rights of newly freed slaves. Um, drawing on anti-slavery constitutionist ideology, the 1866 Act relies on citizenship as a font of individual rights. The day that the 13th Amendment was declared part of the Constitution by the Secretary of State, Congress began debating uh, this right, the, the act that eventually uh, became known as the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Um, uh, this person who introduced the act in the Senate, Lyman Trumbull, explained that the second clause of the 13th Amendment was intended for the purpose of preventing state legislatures from enslaving any pretense those whom the first clause declared should be free. So responding to the black codes that had taken away those rights, the essential human rights, or purported to do so, of freed slaves. The Citizenship Clause of the Act declared all persons born in the United States and within the jurisdiction um, not subject to any foreign power, excluding Indians not taxed, as, as Martha talked about who, um, in the first uh, panel, um, are citizens of the United States. Now this was contrary to the Dred Scott ruling at, um, of the Supreme Court, and it's interesting to pause for a second and think, why did the members of the Reconstruction Congress think they could pass legislation that was directly contrary to a Supreme Court ruling. One reason may be that they believed that former slaves became citizens when the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. And this is certainly consistent with what many of the anti-slavery constitutionalists had believed. Or they believed that the enforcement clause of the 13th Amendment empowered Congress to overturn the Supreme Court's interpretation of the US Constitution. And there is some uh, support for that in the record of the debates over the act as well. Um, so just given another uh, point of the, the scope of the Congressional Enforcement Clause, at least as viewed by the framers of the 13th Amendment. The act um, provided that all citizens have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to make an enforced contract sue, be parties, and give evidence, inherit, purchase, lease, sell, and hold, and convey real estate and personal property. So at the very least, um, the, the act recognized those uh, rights that were known at the time as, as civil rights, um, the rights to basically engage in the legal system, just like anybody else, um, to be citizenship rights. But the act goes on to say, and to the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of person and property. As, in, as is enjoyed by white citizens. The, the 1866 Act was part of a broad program by Congress to protect the rights of former slaves, including especially their right to free labor and other citizenship rights. Along with the 1866 Act, Congress approved an amendment to the Freedmen's Bureau Act, which would have given broad power to the federal government to enforce the rights on the ground. And the, and the Freedmen's Bureau uh, was they, they, they empowered the executive branch to enforce those rights. Um, uh, I mentioned what Lennon Trumbull said. His colleague, Pennsylvania Representative Martin Thayer, agreed that Congress's for enforcement power extended to abolishing and destroying forever all features of slavery which are op oppressive in their character, which extinguish the rights of free citizens, and which unlawfully control their liberty. And this is, this is evidence um, that the, the, the Reconstruction Congress really viewed citizenship as a major font of rights, as the central font of rights. And that when they constitutionalized the 1866 Act with the 14th Amendment and its citizenship clause and the privileges and its own privileges or immunities clause, they really thought the privileges or immunities clause would be the primary clause that uh, people would rely on for the protection of rights. Um, the, the uh, opponents of the, of the act argued that the 13th Amendment did not empower Congress to enact such broad legislation. Um, uh, they argued that it only empowered Congress to abolish slavery. But they were few, they were outvoted. The most influential member of the Congress who made the argument that the 13th Amendment enforcement power did not enforce or support this act was John Bingham, as was mentioned earlier. But Bingham didn't, dis didn't dispute the scopes of the right defined in the act. What he was concerned about was that the 13th Amendment, he, had, he thought, did not empower Congress to enforce rights against state governments. And so the 14th Amendment 
Uh, his original draft of, the, of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment um, uh, would have given Congress the power to enforce the rights and privileges and immunities of citizens against state governments. Eventually, the Joint Committee on Reconstruction revised the amendment, added the Citizenship Clause virtually identical to the 1866 Act. And so what did the Privileges or Immunities Clause mean? Um, uh, at the very least, it meant to constitutionalize those rights that were listed in the 1866 Act, uh, contracts, um, appear in court, own property. Um, uh, but the act was broad and referred to other rights. Members of Congress, um, some members of Congress argued, such as Jacob Howard, argued that they were all natural rights, that this made all natural rights enforceable against the states. Uh, Bingham, as we discussed, said that he thought that the Privileges or Immunities Clause made the Bill of Rights enforceable against the states. Um, in the slaughterhouse cases in 1873, um, the court articulated a more cramped vision of citizenship rights than, uh, of federal citizenship rights than anyone in the Reconstruction Congress. But I just want to say one thing about that. Slaughterhouse, in Slaughterhouse, the court focused on the right of mobility, the right to travel, the right to be on the open seas and protected by park pirates. And even that was a very significant right for freed slaves, because if they were deprived one thing, it was the right of mobility, right? They couldn't leave the plantation. They couldn't go any place other than where they were forced to stay by their masters. And one of the first things they did after they were freed was to go out and travel um, and to go and look for their family members. Um, and one of the things that the, that the black coats did was made it very hard for them to do so, because they would be, um, uh, they were in danger of being uh, arrested for being idle and not uh, and not working. They were required to enter into con year-long contracts. Mm -hmm. And um, after the uh, 1866 Civil Rights Act and after Reconstruction and into the uh, post-Reconstruction period, this continued to happen to free blacks um, that were they were arrested on the road, tried for vagrancy, imprisoned, and treated as um, the as essentially as slaves. And so they unfortunately were not able to enjoy even that most basic of right of citizenship as a result of the um, retrenchment of um, the southern states after Reconstruction. Professor, thanks so much. Um, next, Anthony Sanders from the Institute for Justice. Anthony works in the Minnesota office. Um, he focuses his practice on this audacious idea of using state constitutions to protect individual rights. Yeah, America doesn't have just one constitution. We've got 51, and American constitutional law is about far more than what began in Philadelphia 231 years ago. It's also about what happens and continues to happen in state capitals from sea to shining sea. So he'll talk about that. He'll transition us um, to questions about the language and the scope of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. He'll discuss his research on what that phrase, privileges or immunities, meant among the states and why the 14th Amendment framers might have turned to that language to accomplish their objectives. Um, some trivia about Anthony, he's a dual citizen of UK, the UK and the US. He grew up on two islands also, Vachon, Vachon, off the coast of Washington State, Vachon, and Alderney in the British Channel Islands. So he still says my eight-year-old daughter can still swim faster than me. So Anthony told me last night he may trigger some people today. So don't disappoint, Anthony. Go ahead. All right. Well, we're going to start the triggering of pop quiz. Can anyone name the first clause in, Amer in an American constitution that had the words privileges and immunities, or privilege or immunity, uh, within a couple words of each other? Uh, the, anyone have any guess? The arrest clause, right? Everyone going to fail? The arrest clause? The arrest clause was in what constitution? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Virginia. Virginia is a guess. That's a really good guess. That they did not have privileges within a couple words of immunities. The answer is, and, and this will be something that 
that folks from this state can at last be proud of, uh, New Jersey. <laughs> um, although it only applied to members of a Protestant sect, of any Protestant sect, so Catholics, Jews, you're kind of out of luck, um, in 1776 in New Jersey, but the Constitution that was ratified in early July, a good time to sign a document of 1776 in New Jersey, um, had the nation's first privileges or immunities clause. But privileges or immunities, those words, privileges and immunities, um, was not at all a weird phrase, an uncommon phrase. It's just New Jersey had one of the first constitutions that happened to use this language. In fact, before the 14th Amendment, um, there were 29 American constitutions, or things like constitutions, that had um, a, some, something like a privileges or immunities clause um, in them. They, they often did very different things, but they used that language. One of those was, of course, the U.S. Constitution, Article 4. Another was the Articles of the Confederation. But the 27 others were state constitutions, and there I'm counting like, different constitutions of the same state. So, for example, New Hampshire had three different constitutions with a privileges or immunities type of clause um, along the way. Uh, but 27 times, Americans got together, wrote a constitution, and used the word privileges and immunities. So I thought, well, this is, might have some bearing on what people thought privileges or immunities meant in, in 1866 or, or 1868. Um, and what I found, I think, takes a little bit of um, the mysticism away from the privileges or immunities clause, and I'll, I'll get to that um, in, in, in a minute. Um, also, it shows, at the end of the day, uh, it shows that, the, and this isn't anything new, a lot of people uh, have written about this, including a couple of esteemed professors in front of me, um, that the real work of the Privileges or Immunities Clause is not the word privileges or immunities, it's of citizens of the United States. Um, that's why we've heard so much about citizenship. That's the important part of the clause. Um, but in understanding what privileges or immunities is doing, um, I think we can, uh, we can learn more about what was going on with the, the Reconstruction Congress. I, I, don't think, I don't make the claim that learning about these state constitutions uh, tells us what they were doing in Reconstruction Congress. I, don't, I, mean, I haven't read through all the debates like some people in this room have, but I don't think that this was much on their minds when they were, they, they were crafting it. I think Article 4 very much was. Um, but I think it can tell us a bit about what some people call the original public meaning of the word privileges uh, or immunities was. Um, so privileges or immunities has been used in, uh, these, these words are used in all kinds of legal documents, going back a very, a very long way. Uh, in corporate charters, in treaties, in um, colonial charters, especially from the crown. Uh, this has been well documented, but for some reason it, wasn't, it hasn't been done in the context of American constitutions. Um, so that's why I dove in, into this work. Privileges or immunities um, is sometimes used by, by uh, uh, I've been guilty of this, many people at IJ have been guilty of this, many libertarians have used this, as kind of this like mystical phrase that, um, and it's with good reason, because right, it's been buried for 145 years, essentially. And so we're trying to unbury this, this clause. And, and so we, we have these weird words that people don't use much today, privileges or immunities. And we say, well, the, um, you know, they didn't say rights in, in the 14th Amendment. They said just privileges or immunities. And, and if you look, there's this other part of the Constitution, Article 4, that has privileges and immunities. And notice, in the 14th Amendment, there's an or in there. And, and it kind of sounds like we're describing the illusion mysteries, you know, like you're, I'm going to let you in on some, some special language at this, here. At this point, Nicolas Cage walks in. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's very true. Um, uh, he'll, he'll be coming for the next, uh, next table, I believe. Um, but the, the, the truth is, privileges and immunities was a very normal language at that time. And, it, and, and I'll give a couple of examples of, of how it was used in, um, uh, in language. So here is the, Harp, uh, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 had this clause in it, written, mostly written by John Adams, um, that 
uh, it's specific to Harvard College. So this is something in the, the, the supreme law of the land for Massachusetts that is specific to a, a school. Uh, and it says, uh, it protects basically the, the rights of Harvard College. And it says, uh, shall um, have, hold, use, exercise, and enjoy all the powers, authorities, rights, liberties, privileges, immunities, and franchises, which they now have or are entitled to have, hold, use, exercise, or enjoy. Uh, as I say in the paper, there's a little Harvard grade inflation going on there. Um, so they use seven different words there to describe the, the interests that are protected of Harvard College. Uh, the lawyers write constitutions uh, pr you know, primarily. I mean, there's a lot of lawyers involved, right? And lawyers like words and contracts. And so they apply that to constitutions. And so we get all these words in there, which really just mean interests, rights. They're all pretty synonymous. Um, but, but we have all these words, and two of them in this, in this series are privileges or immunities. Here's another one. This is actually, this is not in the Constitution, but it's emblematic from the New York Colonial Legislature of uh, 1691 um, about, uh, I'm not even sure what it, what it describes, but the, the interests of some uh, corporation they were forming, I think. And they say every one of their former rights, customs, prerogatives, privileges, preeminences, practices, immunities, liberties, franchises, royalties, and usages whatsoever. I think you're pretty protected if you can use all those, uh, those words to protect your interests. Um, really what they're doing in all these different uh, clauses, sometimes there'll be rights, privileges, or immunities, sometimes privileges, immunities, and estates, sometimes liberties, franchises, privileges, often privileges gets used, but immunity doesn't. What they're protecting are your interests, your rights. That's what they were doing with the 14th Amendment. Um, privileges or immunities probably grafted, as, as people know the story from Article 4, because it, it, it does much of the, the same thing. But exactly what a privilege is, exactly what an immunity is, they're all the same word, essentially. They're your rights, broadly understood. We're not just talking about natural rights here. We're also talking about um, uh, basic principles of uh, criminal procedure. Uh, we're talking about things like your right to a subsidy. If the law's been passed, that you, you should get that benefit, and and therefore you have a privilege or immunity to to get that. Very broadly understood. So when we interpret the privileges or immunities clause, the heavy lifting is done by of citizens of the United States. That being said, when we look at these different constitutions for how they use privileges or immunities, even though the meaning is the same, I think it can give us a clue as to what's like in the middle of what, when you use these words, what was understood to be protected. And there were three major contexts where privileges or immunities type clauses were um, protected in state constitutions. One of them was the protection of corporations, uh, corporate bodies, especially um, religious societies. So there are many constitutions from the time of the founding that have privileges or immunities type, type of clauses that protect the rights of religious societies. Some of them go even broader and protect all corporate uh, bodies, the, the, their rights generally. And this is because this is the language of corporations. The Hudson Bay Charter, for example, talks about the privileges or immunities of the Hudson Bay Company. Um, this is how corporate charters were, were written, colonial charters. Um, also, there's the understanding of equality. Um, the, there, there were several, uh, including this one from New Jersey, privileges or immunities clauses that really today we would call them equal protection clauses. But they were, they were written in a way that a privilege or immunity is actually kind of a bad thing if it's given out to just one person or one group of people. And so they're saying, if you're going to give out privileges or immunities, it has to be to everyone. Um, there was a, a, a clause in the Tennessee Constitution in 1834 that was placed in there that essentially did this. And then they got more and more popular as we get to the 14th Amendment. One in Ohio in 1851, right? John Bingham, I'm sure, was familiar, very familiar with that clause. Uh, also, a, a couple other states on the eve of the Civil War, and they, and they even get more and more popular after, um, after the 14th Amendment. 
So there's an understanding that if you see privileges or immunities, it has something to do with everyone uh, being equal. You see a little bit of this in the slaughterhouse dissents when, when they talk about how this was, you know, this was a special favor for one corporation. But also, privileges or immunities is used in the context of fundamental liberties. Uh, the Massachusetts Constitution um, that, that I just read from, and also the New Hampshire Constitution shortly thereafter, had law of the land clauses, which are just drawn from, from Magna Carta, uh, where they talk about you have these interests that are protected um, and can't be taken away but by uh, the law of the land or, or um, a jury of your peers. Uh, and those would use the, the words immunities and or privileges. So when we just see the word privileges and immunities in a constitutional document in the 1860s, um, all three of these areas are comfortably within that language. Now, if you read the full 14th Amendment, it's hard to make an argument that we're protecting corporate bodies there because citizenship, when we just talk about how citizens are born in the United States, it's a little bit of a stretch to, to talk about corporate uh, protections. But it very much seems that they might be protecting equality. And it very much seems also that they might be protecting fundamental liberties. Um, and I think my, at the end of the day, my take from, from doing, reading these state constitutions is that the 14th Amendment could be protecting both of those things, equality and fundamental liberties. And there isn't necessarily a, a conflict because I know there's the, the one camp and the, and the other camp in, in this regard. Um, and so maybe we should understand the privileges or immunities clause to be protecting both of them and have a big tent view of what the Reconstruction Congress was trying to do there. Anthony, thank you. It is high noon. We got 20 minutes left. So I'm going to introduce our final two speakers um, to kind of bring the audience forward to the present. And I'll introduce this dynamic duo together. Um, Professor Josh Blackman of the South Texas College of Law, Houston, and Ilya Shapiro of the Cato Institute are going to discuss how the clause is interpreted or not or disregarded today. And they may talk about the role of the clause in the McDonald case, the cameo role it played, what has happened in the eight or so years since McDonald, and their proposed approach for interpreting the clause today. I first met Josh when he was a law student That's right. many years ago. At an IJ conference. At an IJ conference. And um, today, he is a highly caffeinated scholar. I don't think he's talking about <laughs> whose, office, whose office resembles like NASA mission control. It has like these large monitors from wall to wall. It's really jarring. Um, John writes about everything. And he speaks everywhere. And he tweets all the time. And next to Josh is Ilya Shapiro. Um, so kind of help set the modern stage. Ilya is someone who also writes and speaks and tweets to everyone, everywhere, about everything. Ilya is a senior fellow in constitutional studies at Cato. He is a rarity because he was naturalized not once but twice. And I knew Cato was pro-immigration, but this is really dedicated. So Ilya was born in Moscow. And he and his family lived in refugee housing in Rome when he was young, I think around four. And he ultimately, his family came to Canada. And Ilya says, soon I discovered that I preferred life, liberty, and property over peace, order, and good government. So I spent my childhood plotting to get to America. <laughs> so starting with college, Ilya has lived his entire adult life in America culminating in his naturalization ceremony four years ago. Yes. And as Ilya is prone to telling people proudly, I do a job most native-born Americans won't do, <laughs> defending the Constitution. So I'll take it away. Great. Um, well, so McDonald, uh, eight years ago, the litigation started you know, a decade ago. Uh, after Heller uh, declared the individual right to keep and bear arms, uh, the question under the 14th Amendment was whether that right extends to the states. And indeed, the Supreme Court had the option of taking different appeals and different framings of this question. The question presented that the Supreme Court took up was 
whether the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms is incorporated as against the states by the 14th Amendment's privileges or immunities or due process clauses. So it's not simply, should we incorporate it? Is it incorporated? Specifically calling for briefing and argument, uh, not just on substantive due process, which is easy, they know how to do that, uh, but on privileges or immunities as well. And around the time, right before McDonald was argued, Josh and I published a, a, a law review article in the Georgetown Journal of Law and Public Policy called Keeping Pandora's Box Sealed, basically presenting a, uh, a faithful, constitutionally faithful interpretation of not incorporation, because that's a constitutional misnomer that the framers of the, sixth, of the 14th Amendment had wanted simply to incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states. They could have just said that. Instead, the 14th Amendment protects rights that are both greater and lesser than uh, those codified explicitly uh, in the Bill of Rights. Uh, but regardless, um, the court wanted to know, given the scholarly consensus, I mean, on which issues is there scholarly consensus across ideological, methodological uh, lines, uh, but you know, briefing, strong briefing and, and academic uh, work uh, that the Privileges and Immunities Clause is the one that is supposed to protect most substantive rights. I mean, some substantive rights are protected under the due process of law, and lots of folks in this room have written about that. Um, but it would be more constitutionally faithful and uh, tying to the text, meaning at worst, we'll get the same results as we have now, and at best, we'll have a constitutionally faithful standard rather than just whatever you can get five votes for, uh, which is essentially what the standard in, in substantive due process uh, uh, has been. Uh, in the end, uh, as we know, um, the Privileges and Immunities Clause got one vote for, no votes against, and, and that's it. I mean, nobody <laughs> else discussed it. Not, not the majority, not the, not the dissent, uh, but Clarence Thomas's, uh, Justice Thomas's uh, 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 stirring concurrence, uh, necessary fifth vote, uh, goes into this and talks about how, uh, uh, beyond kind of the substantive reasons that we went into in the, in the history, um, uh, Slaughterhouse was dishonest in separating federal and state rights, and, and there's a, a lot of overlap. So, um, well, that was, that was McDonald. What's happened since then? We've done some original research that Josh will talk about. Not much. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ilya. It's a pleasure to be you. I am an alumni of the George Mason Law School. I was an articles editor. Are, are you legion? Your alumni? I don't know. See, this guy can never <laughs> leave me alone. I was also an articles editor on the George Mason Law Review some years ago, so it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, our research of what's happened since McDonald, unfortunately, is fairly brief, but I'll make it long because it's over time. <laughs> <laughs> One of the prominent rights that's long been associated with the Privileges or Immunities Clause is what's often called a right of contract, perhaps economic liberty. Um, this right was perhaps vilified the most in a case called Lochner, right? But in fact, there was actually a fairly long understanding of rights of contract. If we go back to Corfield versus Coriel, there's discussion of the right to exchange property. And by the way, read Justice Willis' dissent, a concurrence in the Patel case from the Texas Supreme Court. He goes through a lot of this. If you look at the Civil Rights Act of 1866, it expressly protects the right of contract. And then we get to the 14th Amendment. Is it any surprise that the very first cases brought to the court about the privileges or immunities clause concern economic liberty? You had Slaughterhouse, which was uh, the rights of the butchers to work, and the other case, Bradwell versus Illinois, which was the right of female attorney to be admitted to the bar. Why was this major provision of the Constitution the very first test cases concerning rights of contract and not, you know, something to build rights perhaps, or perhaps a racially equal issue. Why is it this? I think, and Randy Barnett thinks, and other people in this room tend to think, that this is because the privileges or immunities clause protected this right of contract, this economic liberty. Now, we all know the end of the story, Slaughterhouse killed the clause, and as a result, the court shifted to the due process clause and Locke and other cases in the progressive era. But we think, really, and I at least, that there is a very strong argument that economic liberty ought to be protected by the 14th Amendment. So we were able to find about 100 cases in the last decade or so that have cited PRI. Um, a number of them focused on economic liberty claims, many of them brought by the Institute for Justice, one of the sponsors of this wonderful conference. And in almost every single case, the court rejected it. 
And in fact, I think the credit basically tells district courts, we agree we're going to lose, we're just going to raise it for purposes of preserving for appeal, which I think is the, probably the prudent method, say, the briefing pages. Uh, but there's been not any effort to reanimate this. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, the court will in the future, uh, but I think there's such a stigma against Lochnerism. And look at Chief Justice Roberts' dissent in the uh, Obergefell decision, where it's just like he uses Lochner's as epithet that has no actual meaning, but you just you hate it. And now Justice Kagan says they're weaponizing the first amendment for Lochnerism. So the, the stigma of economic liberty is just very um, uh, blunted. But I'm still relieved that um, occupational reform has proceeded in legislative affairs, so don't rely entirely on the courts. The second area where PRI has been litigated was called the right to travel. Rebecca, I think, gave a wonderful discussion of this before. Um, plaintiffs have actually had a little bit more success on this case, and it's raised in you know, unexpected places. For example, if a state imposes a licensing requirement on out-of-state real estate dealers, for example, uh, there are instances where you have a PRI challenge. There's also a case from, was it Oregon with the, uh, the ferry system, or was it Washington State, Washington State, where the ferry system, whether it's from one part of the state to the other, on the navigable waters, is that a violation of PRI? Um, but you still have uh, a hesitancy of the courts to give any real weight to the privileges or unions clause. And I think that still stems back from Slaughterhouse, and I have McDonald was willing to revisit it. The third area, and I'll wrap up here, which is actually quite surprising, is the death penalty. Um, the, the, the slaughterhouse cases said that one of the privileges or immunities is the right of security for our citizens by treaty to foreign nation. And I had forgotten that was even in there. But apparently a lot of death penalty advocates cite this. And they argue that the various lethal injection protocols in the United States violate international treaties. So therefore when the state executes someone pursuant to these uh, various uh, cocktails as they're called, they're actually violating the 14th Amendment privileges or immunities clause. Um, again, these claims haven't gone anywhere. And I think it's unfortunate the courts just haven't taken it seriously. I like Bob's discussion of a coup. You know, we have this entire major provision of the Constitution which the judiciary would just pretend would not exist. And uh, I don't see any movement, even after McDonald, to revisit this, but I think that's a tragic mistake. And on the 150th anniversary of McDonald, we should all lament the fact that this, this crown jewel of our Constitution has just been cast in crud and put out the, put out the pastor. <laughs> Uh, oh, thank and, you so much. And, and just one line on where we go from here. Well, first of all, this term at the Supreme Court, there is an incorporation case, there although is. it doesn't list the question presented the same way that I read uh, McDonald's, the, the Tims v. Indiana case about uh, civil asset forfeiture and the, uh, the Eighth Amendment's uh, excessive fines clause, whether it should be uh, incorporated. So at least we'll, we'll, we'll have some discussion about the original meaning of the Fourteenth Amendment. And of course now uh, Justice Gorsuch is on the court. Uh, he's a strong originalist and a, and a, and a classical liberal, and uh, maybe we'll join uh, Thomas in that interest. Um, Brett Kavanaugh has not had an op opportunity to uh, opine on the 14th Amendment as such. His non busy. His non well, I don't mean in the last month or, or the last 48 hours, but, uh, um, but even his non, you know, the D.C. Circuit doesn't take, obviously, incorporation cases, and uh, his non-judicial writings fo focus on structure and powers, not rights, but... Uh, and someone on Twitter uh, uh, said that this was the quickest citation of a uh, uh, Supreme Court confirmation hearing in an SSRN uh, posted paper. There was an exchange between Senator Cruz, who asked about unenumerated rights at the confirmation hearing, and Kavanaugh replied, I think the Ninth Amendment and the Privileges and Immunities Clause and the Supreme Court's doctrine of substantive due process are three roads that someone might take that all really lead to the same destination. So time will tell whether Kavanaugh sees the distinction between PRI and substantive due process as meaningful in any particular case, but I think uh, it'll take a case like Tim's or something else that is kind of a, of a lower uh, political salience uh, for the court uh, when it has a, a critical mass of originalists to uh, start applying it again. And then there's the rub, the privileges or immunities clause applies to citizens of the United States. How would an incorporated right apply to non-citizens? And that's actually a fairly live issue. What are the rights of non-citizens within our borders? It's a very hot issue. I think during McDonald, Justice Sotomayor asked, you know, would, would, would aliens not be protected by a grand jury indictment, for example, if these PRIs? So there's still some other issues where, where the court may have hesitancy to go that, go that route. Thank you. So I have impertinent questions for all of our panelists, but I'm going to show some commendable moderator restraint. 
And um, moderator restraint, okay. Judicial restraint, I'm not okay. very measured with my words. I'm very careful with my words. I want to show commendable moderator restraint and give the last few minutes to our audience two, engagement. Audience engagement, our, our, our two questioners. Go ahead. Oh, they've been waiting for a while. Oh, they're going to hold. They're going to hold the microphone. <laughs> Professor, step right up. Elon Musk. No, no, sorry. Elon Musk. Uh, thank you for a terrific panel. Uh, in the last few minutes, I guess I wanted to provide some balance uh, to this panel because everyone on the panel seems to adopt the incorporation thesis, the fundamental rights reading of the privileges and immunities clause. Well, I, I said, I said, incorporation is a is a misnomer. A it is a mis misnomer, perhaps, but you still adopt that thesis. Uh, and so it's not the only reading of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, right? There's the David Curry reading, the John Harrison reading, that the Privileges or Immunities Clause is actually just an anti-discrimination provision. Whatever privileges or immunities a state happens to afford its citizens, it must afford to all of its citizens alike equally. Very quickly, three pieces of evidence for this view. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was mentioned, and the 14th Amendment is often seen as constitutionalizing it. It doesn't say, all citizens have a right to acquire contracts, property, sue and be sued. It says they shall enjoy the same rights as is enjoyed by white citizens. Article four, the comedy clause is a non-discrimination provision, right? Whatever rights, privileges, or immunities the state affords its own citizens, it must afford visiting citizens from other states. <laughs> Last piece of evidence is the Black Code, right? The problem with the Black Code wasn't that the states were abolishing the right to bear arms or abolishing the right to free speech. It was that they were denying those rights to free black citizens. And the anti-discrimination reading would solve that problem too, because so long as the state constitutions had a right to bear arms, and in the South they all did, now the, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the anti-discrimination reading means you have to give that right to black citizens too. So why is the anti-discrimination reading wrong? And why is the incorporation thesis right? So answer this quickly, then we'll take one final sure. question here Could and we're I, done. Can I take that or? Sure. It. Yeah. I, I tend to re, uh, read things rather simplistically, so I think the anti-discrimination aspect of the 14th Amendment is in the Equal Protection Clause, and that the Privileges or Immunities Clause, in fact, was meant to refer to rights more broadly. Excuse me, can I have the response to this? You don't have the mic anymore. <laughs> the uh, Privileges or Immunities Clause has used two different words, privileges and immunities, and to me, I, I don't think that they use them as meaning the same thing in different ways. To me, immunities are the protection of the natural rights of people, and the privileges are the positive rights granted from the Constitution. Uh, is there any reason why this interpretation is wrong? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, 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 the use of these, these different words, privileges, immunities, liberties, franchises, estates, um, liberties, uh, they're used so many times in so many documents to mean the same thing. Um, technically, Blackstone talks about this, and there's a little bit of other support for this, that they look at, if you look at the word privileges and you look at the word immunities, they have slightly different meanings, and that privileges is something it, 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 in a uh, a lock-in view of the social contract. Privileges are what you get because you enter into society, what society gives you. Immunities are what you don't give up to society as part of the social contract and, and you retain. But then they, they still say, oh, they're pretty darn close in what they mean. Um, so I don't think we can hi do a hyper-textualist analysis of the 14th Amendment and think, well, okay, it means this, and then it means a little bit more of this and the immunities. Um, when they're used in the constitutional context over and over and over again to really have the, the same thing. And there's, there's as many clauses in state constitutions before the 14th Amendment that say rights and privileges as say privileges or immunities. But they kind of all are in the same places and trying to do the same thing. Are we, are we supposed to say, well, the rights and privileges clauses have this going on and the privileges and immunities clause have this going on? No, I think they're all just ways to protect uh, interests of the people in those states. My former colleague on the Texas Supreme Court, Dale Wainwright, will have the final question. He's gonna also preside on our slaughterhouse reenactment later this afternoon. Justice Wainwright. Ooh. 
Thank you, Judge. <laughs> and I've enjoyed the sound immensely. I have a, a brief question. Let me read uh, part of two sentences from a dissent by the first Justice Harlan with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. He says, there is a dangerous tendency in these latter days to enlarge the function of the courts by means of judicial interference with the will of the people as expressed by the legislature. Each of these governments must keep within the limits defined by the Constitution. So Justice Harlan raises early on, maybe not the first, but one of the first suggestions of judicial activism, if you will, except in the reverse context of what we normally consider. It is courts refusing to enforce individual rights protected by the Constitution. And that's what I think Justice Harlan refers to when he says the dangerous tendency to enlarge the functions of the courts, refusing to enforce these rights. The question is, is this dissent by Justice Harlan evidence of the judicial hijacking of the 14th Amendment as someone referenced before? I think Bob did. Rebecca? Yeah, um, so Justice Harlan, two very important dissents. Uh, that was a dissent in Plessy versus Ferguson and also the dissent in um, the uh, 1883 civil rights cases. And in both of them, he articulates a vision of citizenship that I think is more consistent with the, that of the framers, um, that it was meant to be broad, that it was meant to be uh, meaningful, and that, for example, in the civil rights cases, um, that it was not limited uh, by the he, in the civil rights cases, the court articulates the state action doctrine that the 14th Amendment doesn't um, uh, extend to private activities, so Congress couldn't uh, regulate discrimination by private actors. But in his dissent, he says um, that uh, to be what the 14th Amendment did, the number one, one thing that the 14th Amendment did was to make uh, free slaves, to recognize free slaves as citizens with the right to citizenship and that includes the right to be free of discrimination. It includes a, an, an affirmative obligation, or at least an affirmative ability of, of, uh, of states to protect um, uh, citizens against private infringement on their rights. So I think that um, it's interesting to think that, the, I, I don't remember that, that judicial activism uh, apart from the Plessy versus Ferguson but um, I think it is true, it's, it is consistent with Bob, what Bob said, that there really was a judicial hijacking. And uh, so ironically, at, this, at the time when, when you think about originalism, I know there are very number, large number of people in this um, building that support originalism. This was while the framers were still alive. And yet the court interprets these provisions the opposite of what they really meant. And with that, it is lunchtime. Thanks to our lively panel. Thank you.